If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, would you turn with me to Isaiah 40? We're going to look at Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 11. Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 11. We're going to pray, and then we will jump in. All right, so Lord, we, we thank you that we get to be here this morning, and we thank you that we get to see one another this morning. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and give us tender hearts that we might receive what you have to say to us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Allow me to, to paint a picture for you guys. So imagine with me that there's a, a man, and he's in his, let's say, late 40s, right? And so this man, he, um, he wakes up a little bit early one day, and so he goes to his kitchen, and he makes himself a cup of coffee, and decides, you know what? I'm up early, I have a little bit of time before I go to work, let's sit down and watch, watch the news really quick. So he sits down to watch the news, and he flicks it on, and he's enjoying his cup of coffee, and, and, and on the news, he just sees terrible story after terrible story. There's, there's been a war that's raging in this part of the world for years now. There's, there's another round of corruption going on somewhere in this part of the government here. COVID has just taken another thousand people in some other country. He's, he's sitting there listening, and, and there's been another terrible tragedy. He's sitting there listening, and there's, there's been a, a, a terrible crime that's occurred again. And so he, he's, he just had enough, and so he, he flicks it off, and he, he says, maybe things will get better as I go to work. So he ends up going to work, and um, I believe I'm going to switch mics quickly. Can you guys hear me now? Yes? Perfect, perfect. Okay, so he, he, he has this sinking feeling, right? And so he switches off the news and says, hopefully uh, things will get better as I go to work. So he goes to work, right? And he's there, and the day goes by quickly. It goes by well. And, but, in fact, it seems like this whole time it's been going by quickly. I mean, he started 15 years ago, and it just feels like yesterday that he began his job. So he, he shakes his head, and he, and he gets in his car to go home. And on his way home, he gets stuck in traffic because that's what always happens, right? So he's sitting there in traffic, and he sees the absolute worst of humanity when he's sitting in traffic. <laughs> People are angry with one another. People are, are saying not nice things to one another. People are all impatient and things like that. And he's just, he's just reeling from all this. So he, 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 he get, makes it home. He's greeted by his family, and he loves his family. He ends up making dinner for the family, and then everybody has a good night, and everybody goes to bed, and he returns to his kitchen, and he sits down to reflect on his day. And, and, and as he's sitting there, thinking about everything that's happened, he, tears start to stream down his face. He starts to think about all the things he heard about this morning. He starts to think about how his life is just passing him by. He starts to think about, about all, the, all, the, all, the, all the impatience of all the people around him and everything like that. And, and he, tears are just streaming down his face. He's overwhelmed with hopelessness about the world and about his life. And he stops. And he gets up. He wipes the tears from his face. And he heads to bed, thinking, maybe things will be better tomorrow. Friends, it's, it's, it's easy to conclude that this man has no hope, right? It's easy to conclude that this man, he has, he has no guarantee that things are going to be okay one day. He has no guarantee that all the injustice that he's seen, all the crimes that have been committed, all the corruption that's ever happened in the world will be set right. He has, he has no guarantee of that. He has no guarantee that all the things, all the wrong things he's done will be forgiven one day. He has nothing. And so he just hopes maybe tomorrow will be better. Friends, that might be the perspective of, of, of one man, but things are supposed to be different for Christians, right? As Christians, we're supposed to have hope. We're supposed to have a hope that's supposed to, that's supposed to keep us going and things like that. I mean, Christians are always talking about hope, right? But the truth of the matter is, if we don't know what this hope is, or, or, or if we're not focused on this hope, then life is going to pass us by. We're going to get jaded. Things are going to just pull us to the right and to the left, and our life will pass us by, and we'll be like that man one day, sitting all alone in our kitchen table hoping maybe tomorrow will be better. 
Friends, we have to know what this hope is. We have to know it, and we have to keep our focus on it. So what is it? What is the hope that we're supposed to have? Well, uh, Isaiah 40, 1 through 11, speaks of this hope. Let's, let's turn there. I'm going to read it through once, and then we'll break it down together. So it says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Verse 3, a voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. Let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. And then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Verse 6, a voice says, call out. Then he answered, what should I call out? Say, all flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Yes, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Verse 9, get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up and do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. And he will gently lead the nursing ones. So this is, this is a, a, a piece of writing that's probably about 2,700 years old at this point. So this, this was a piece of writing that was written to the people of Judah, which was the southern kingdom of Israel. But the reality of it is, this is still God's word. And that means as Christians today, we can still learn and we can still take hope in the word that God has spoken, even if it's been spoken to somebody else. So so we have to understand what was going on in this passage in order for it to speak hope into our lives today. So, like I said, this was written by the prophet Isaiah to the people of Judah. And Judah was the southern kingdom of, of the nation of Israel. And so God had made this covenant with Israel, the nation, the whole nation, and said, if you guys, um, I'll be your God and I will keep you on the condition that, that, that you worship me only and that you obey me. So that was the deal that was made. That was the covenant that was made. And, and the people of Israel were doing it for a while. They were doing all right. And then all of a sudden, Judah starts to, to, to worship other gods. Judah starts to not obey God. And so after a while and after pleading with them, God says, enough is enough. I'm going to send Babylon, and they're going to take you, and they're going to take you into exile. They're going to come, take you over, and they're going to take you out of the land that you're in now. And so God says, Isaiah, tell them. So Isaiah goes and tells them, and if you read through Isaiah, he just got done telling them this. And then, and then so the, the people of Israel now, are, or, or the people of Judah, are in disarray. They have all these questions floating around in their mind. They're like, well, 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 are, are, are we still God's people? Is he, is he still going to deliver us? Is he still going to be there for us? Is he still our God like it's always been? So these people are in disarray. They have all these questions floating around. They're, they're losing hope and all these things. And so God says, okay, Isaiah... Go and tell them this. And that's what we get in Isaiah 40. So, let's look back, walk through the passage, and hear what God has to say to us today through this. Let's go back to verse 1. God says to them, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem, and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Verse 3, a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So Isaiah looks at the people of Judah He looks them in the eye in the midst of this situation, in the midst of all the news that they just received, and he says to them, speak kindly to these people. Yes, they're in sin. Yes, they're going to go through exile, but but speak kindly to 
to Judah. Tell the, he, t- he speaks of a day when all their wars are over, when all their sins have been forgiven and have paid for, when all the hard times are just a thing of the past. Then in verse 3 through 5, he speaks of a promise. Isaiah says to them, get ready. Guys, make yourselves ready. Prepare yourselves. Why? Because God is coming. Make straight a path in the wilderness because God's going to come down that path and he's going to meet you guys. He says this to them, and, and, and he says, one day at the end of history, God's going to come and everybody's going to see it. God's going to come in all his glory, and the whole earth is going to be awestruck by him in wonder. God's going to come, and every eye will see it, and everybody will, will not be able to escape it. Everyone will look at God and say, oh my goodness, there he is. Isaiah says, that day's coming, and it's coming soon. So, so, so he says all of this, and then he says at the very end, this is assured. Why can we know this is assured? Because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. God said it, it's going to happen. So, so this might be kind of hard to understand, right? right? It, these people lived 2,700 years ago. This is, this is far away from us. Well, think about it like this. Imagine um, you know you're about to go somewhere and see people that, that, that you just love to be around. Think, think of that, that person that uh, maybe, maybe you had friends in college and you're traveling to go see them, and so you're excited to see them. Or maybe, maybe somebody's getting married, and, and yeah, you like the people that are getting married, but what you're really looking forward to is that fun uncle that you get to see, and he's just so much fun. And so you're like, yeah, I, I like you guys, but I'm really here to see my uncle, that kind of thing. Or maybe, or maybe, maybe you're, you're, you have children, and your children have children, and so you're traveling down, and you get to see them one day. And so that week before you go, you're excited. Man, you're, you're just floating on here. You're looking forward, even to that eight-hour drive that you have to make. You're saying, it's going to be okay because I'm going to see them. That's, that's that kind of effect that this message is supposed to have for the people of Judah. They're supposed to hear this and say, God's coming. God's coming. That, yeah, yeah, I might have a week that might be hard. Yeah, I might have this time that I'm going to go through some things. And yeah, I might have to wait, but, but it's going to be okay. I'm going to see him, and I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. That, that's the kind of thing that Isaiah is saying to them here. And so we know that this was written to Judah, right? But we as Christians also have a hope that Jesus is going to come back, right? That our God is going to come back one day in power. He's going to come with all his angels and the glory of his Father, and every eye will see him, and everyone will wonder at how beautiful and glorious he is. One day, that's going to happen. And so as Christians, we have a promise too. We have the same promise as the people of Judah, that our God will come to be with us. Our God will come to be with us. And so what does this mean for us? Well, just like it meant for the people of Judah, when things get hard, when you know things are going to happen, when you have a life that that's, you're just getting overwhelmed by everything, Maybe, maybe the family has this issue or, or, or your jobs has this issue or maybe you're watching the news and it's just taking a toll on you and all these things. And you're looking at all these things and you're just feeling hopeless and you're feeling run down and you're feeling jaded and you're, and, and you're just getting distracted by all these things. We have to stop in those moments. Stop. Take some time. Remember, our God will come to be with us. When he comes to be with us, he's going to make everything okay. He's going to make everything right again. And so in those times when everything seems to be falling apart and nothing seems to be right, stop. Get alone. Pull out Isaiah 40. Read through it again. Remind yourself of these things. If you don't want to be alone, call up some friends that are Christians and talk about how great it's going to be when Jesus comes back. And you'll see that that hope, that hope that you don't have right there, it'll start to come back in your heart. It'll start to be like a little flame. And as you continually meditate on these things, it'll burn into a fire and you'll find yourself getting up one more day ready to face the world because you have a real hope that's within you. Jesus will come again and make all things right. That's our promise. But you might be saying, okay, this, this sounds good, Hunter. That's great. But, but how do I know that's going to happen? If I'm going to put my life on that, how do I know that I can, I can trust that? 
Well, let's look back at Isaiah. Let's look at verse 6. A voice says, call out. Then he answers, well, what, what shall I call out? Say to them, all flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. Yes, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, the word of our God, stands forever. Isaiah is talking about another messenger here, coming to tell the people of Judah, to, 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 to instruct them, and he says, tell them all flesh is grass, and all its dependability, all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. One day it's here, it's beautiful, but the next day it's gone. One day we have all these wonderful plants and everything like that. The next day it's gone and you'll never remember it. Isaiah is saying to them, look, these nations that are so big, these nations that are so powerful, these things that you see that are, that are, that are just huge obstacles, and you're like, how could God ever come back and fix all this? And he says, it's all grass. It's like flowers in a field. It'll be here one day, and soon it'll be gone. But that's not all. Isaiah also says, they're grass, but we're grass too. We're going to be here one day and gone the next. All the things that we put our hands to, all the things that we do are good, but they're only going to be here so long. All the things that we have and all the things that we can, we can, we can earn are going to be here one day and gone the next. And so he says this, but then he comes to verse 8 and he says, yes, surely everything is grass and the grass fades and it withers, but you know what doesn't? The word of our God stands forever. The word of our God will never fade. The word of our God will never fail. The word of our God is dependable, and the word of our God you can count on for all of your days. Why? Because it's not like us. It'll be here forever. So that's what Isaiah says to the people of Judah. But, but we might think, man, that's, that's hard. I, I live in a world that's like grass. What, what, what's that like? Well, think about it like this. Have you ever been, who, who here has driven down Highway 80 before, right? Okay. How many people have gone down 33? You know, you, you go down these highways, right? And, and you, so you're there, and you look out the window, and you see all this, the grass that's along the highways, and all these, all these plants and things like that, and maybe because the mower crew hasn't mowed in a while, and so it's really high and things like that, and you can see it. And so you look at that, and there's all this vegetation, right? But if you look a little bit further in the distance, you see these rolling hills, and these mountains that are really beautiful. And so if you get to thinking about it, you, you, you think, man, all, the, all that grass there, all these plants, they'll be gone by winter. They'll be gone as soon as it gets cold. They might not even last through the summer if it doesn't rain for a few weeks. But those mountains that you see, those mountains, they've been here as long as you and I can remember. They've been here as long as anybody has lived here. And they'll be there until the day that the Lord comes back. You see, we and the things that we do and the nations that we live in are just like that vegetation. Here one day and gone by winter. But the word of our God, the word that we can put our hope in, that's like those mountains. Every day you drive down it, you'll see the same ones. They're not going anywhere, and they're never going to fade away. So, so Isaiah looks at them, and he, and he says, this is the promise, and we can rest assured in this promise. It's not going to fail. Our God has promised us his presence. Our God has promised us his presence, and that promise won't fail. We can put our hope in it. But that means if this is the promise that we're supposed to put our hope in, if this is the one thing that we're supposed to latch on to and hold on to for the rest of our life, that means that we don't put our hope in other things. That means that there's other things that might compete for your hope, but those things aren't actually going to last. They're grass like the flowers that fade away. Now, now this is true, and, 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 and the reality of it is, most of us don't, don't say these things explicitly. Most of us will never walk up to somebody and say, you know, Brother Tom, um, God's great and all, but I have a whole lot of money sitting in my savings account right now, and I'm going to lean on that if things get tough. Nobody will ever say that to you, and if you do, you should probably talk to them about it. But, but the truth of the matter is, is that we might not say it explicitly, but sometimes... If we're honest, in your heart, when things get tough, you start searching for those things. You start searching for those things that you can lean back on, that you can kind of put some hope in. For some of us, it's money. 
Friends, money is grass. It'll be here one day, and it'll be gone. It'll be here for some of your life, and it'll be gone. It's, it's, it's grass. You can't hold on to it forever. For some people, I mean, it might be your retirement state. You might say, you know, I hate this job, but, I, you know, one day I'm going to retire and things are going to be better, right? It might be something like that, but the reality of it is retirement only lasts so long and it'll only be so nice. It's grass. Some of us say, well, 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 you know, the world out there might be crazy, but I live in America. We have the, we have, we're the wealthiest nation in the world, and we have the strongest military in the world. And while that might be true, the reality of it is, just like Isaiah said, America is just like grass. It'll be here, and just like all the other nations of the world, it'll be gone one day. There won't be a trace left of it. It's grass. Some of us, some of us and this seems to be kind of popular right now, we, we start to put our hope in, in, in politics. We start to say, maybe if this person gets elected, then things will be okay. Or, or maybe if this person gets out of office, then these things will be okay. Or maybe if, if this policy gets passed, then things will be okay finally. The reality of it is, friends, that's grass. Those are the flowers of the field. Those politicians are just like you and I, and they'll be gone. And the policies that they make are just like those flowers. They'll be gone. Some of us will do it in, in relationships. Some of us will say, well, maybe when I meet the one, things will get better, or things like that. Or maybe if I make some friends, things will get better. And, and these things are good things, but the truth of the matter is those people are grass. Some of us depend on our hard work. I, I would fall into that a lot. Or we say, man, I, 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 things might be hard, but I can work my way out of this. I can, I can do it. I can get there. But what happens if you can't? What happens if one day you can't work? Where's your hope then? Friends, the things that we have, who we are, and all the things that we can do is all just grass. And one day it's going to be gone. What are you putting your hope in? What are the things that we're going to latch on to? These things are good, but these things aren't the things to put our hope in. Our hope is in the promise that our God has promised us his presence. Our hope is resting in that. And if it's anything, in anything else, it'll disappoint you. And you'll become jaded and just like that man I described earlier. Friends, we have to, to put this hope at the center of our lives and build everything else around it. These things that I described are important, and they're good. They're even important to God. But the reality of it is, is that if we put that at the center and we don't have this promise at the center of our lives, then we're going to go astray. We're going to find ourselves off course. We're going to find ourselves doing things that, 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 that aren't helpful, hoping in things that aren't helpful. And then one day when those things fail, we'll be jaded and hopeless. We have to center our lives on this hope consciously and build everything around that. And when you see one of those things snorting, starting to sneak its way into the center of your hope, you got to stop. you got to realign everything, and you got to put it in its right perspective, or things are just not going to work. Everything is grass, but the word of our Lord stands forever. So this is good, right? But, but you might be saying, well, we might know that he's coming. And, 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 but you might be asking, you know, is, is God's coming something I should be looking forward to? Is this, is this really something that's going to be good for me? And I think that's a fair question. But, but Isaiah, surprisingly, has an answer for that too. Let's look at, it at verse 9. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with his might and with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before them. And like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. And he will gently lead the nursing ones. Isaiah looks at Judah. He looks at them in the midst of all these things that's going to happen. And he says to them, go. Go and tell the good news. This is good news that God's coming. This is good news that he's going to come back and set everything straight one day. This is good. Go tell everybody. Don't be ashamed. Go and scream it from the mountaintops. Say, this is your God, and he's coming back. 
And then he says, this is, this is good, and, and, and I'm going to offer two descriptions of what God's going to be like when he comes. Verse 10 is, is he says, God's going to come like a mighty warrior. He's going to come with his arm ruling before him in power, with his reward and his recompense from his victory in his arm, and he's going to come to his people, vanquishing all evil, and all his enemies will be put under his feet, and everything that opposes God and his plan will be not, and it will all be okay. But that's not all. He says, that's, that's kind of intimidating for people that oppose God. But what about the people? What about God's people? He says to them, he's going to be like a tender shepherd. To them, he's going to come to them and he's going to, he's going to hold them closely. He's going to lead them and hold them in his arms. One arm he's going to have ruling in might and power. And with the other arm, he holds his sheep near to his chest. This is what it's going to be like when God comes to the earth. Some of us might have a hard time grasping this picture as well. So we, but we, we have examples of somebody that can act this way in our lives. Think about it like this. Has anybody ever seen the, the movie The Blind Side? Or, or heard, heard the story of Michael Orr? So in the movie, Michael Orr is this big guy that plays football. I mean, he's strong, he's aggressive, and on the football field, nobody's stopping him, okay? This guy is huge. But then when he comes to his adopted family, he's kind. He's gentle. He's protective of them. And, he, and he's near to them and loves them dearly. It's the same guy. And so we see that, 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 that we can have, this, that one being or one person can have both of these traits at the same time perfectly. We see that that's a reality that we can have. And so when we look at the coming of our God, we can say our God will come in both power and gentleness. Our God's going to come in both power and might, vanquishing all his enemies, and in gentleness when he holds us close. But the reality of it is, is that some of us might not really be looking forward to God's coming. I mean, if we're honest, some of us really like what's going on down here. Not in a bad way, but, you know, I, I really like my job. Or maybe, or maybe there's some things I haven't got to do yet that I, I really want to do, Right? Other, others of us are, are kind of scared of God coming back. If I'm honest, I'd fall in that category. Sometimes there's times where I'm just like, man, they, that thing, that's going to be scary when God comes and, and turns the world upside down. But the reality of it is, is, is we might be scared of this or we might like the world, but we have to remember what Isaiah says it'll be like. We have to remind ourselves of these things, and it's, and it's that God's going to come and he's going to vanquish all evil. Imagine a world where there's nothing going on that's evil, where all injustice has been stopped, where love reigns, and, 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 and mercy and justice flows like a river. That's what happens when God comes and vanquishes his enemies. And in the same sense, us, we've been forgiven, and he comes to us like a tender shepherd. Knowing our faults and having forgiven them, he holds us dearly. We have to remind ourselves of this. When, when, friends, when we find ourselves not particularly excited about God's coming, when we find ourselves maybe kind of dreading it or maybe kind of not very excited for it, you have to stop. You have to remember. Pull out this passage again. Read these last three verses and remind yourself, it's going to be great. This is something I can look forward to. When, 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 when these things are happening, let these realities kind of roll around in your mind throughout the day, and you'll find yourself saying along with Paul, Oh, Lord Jesus, come back. Because things aren't okay until he comes back. We have to remember these things. But that's not all. That's not all. We still have a, a, a hope now. Turn with me to, to, to quickly to Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It'll be up on the screen if, if, if you need it. So Matthew writes, Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Those words sound familiar? When Matthew's writing about, about John the Baptist coming and making the way for Jesus, he's saying, yes, he's making the way for Jesus. And in some sense, when Jesus came, when Jesus, who was, who was God in the flesh, came, Isaiah 40 was fulfilled partially. 
yes, yes, Isaiah 40 is about the end of time when, when God comes back, but it's also been fulfilled because God has come already. He's come in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and that means all the benefits of God's presence, all the tender care that he offers, all the kind leading and all the graciousness that he gives us is available partially now. That's what Matthew's saying there. And yes, so it's, it's available partially now, and we can enjoy it, but it's going to be fully fulfilled later when he comes back and establishes his kingdom on the earth forever. That means that we don't have to go without help now. We don't have to go without, without the tender presence of our God. In his kindness, he's given that to us even now. Friends, this is what, what God has given us. Let's take hold of it. So, what can we say to all of this? We, we walk through the passage, we've learned about what it says to us today. What can we say to all of this? Well, the reality is, is that we must say that the presence of our hope is rooted in the presence of our God. The, 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 pres- or the presence of our hope, the, the, the way hope is actually going to be in our hearts and actually going to affect our lives and keep us on straight and keep us from getting jaded and things like that, is only if we remember that one day our God is going to be present with us. If we lose that reality that God's going to be present, we'll lose the hope in our lives because this world is just too hard in and of itself. We need to have the hope that our God is going to be present with us. We have to keep this in our minds. If the worship team would like to come up. I, I, I think this can, uh, this can apply to us in a few ways. I think there are some people here today that... Um, they might need to renew their hope. Perhaps over the years and over all the hardships and all the things that you face that are as terrible as can be, you've lost it. You've gotten jaded to a point where it's, it's, it, it doesn't spark that, that, that feeling in you that gets you going, that gets you to work in the morning. Maybe you've lost it. Maybe, maybe with some of us, we've placed it in other things. Maybe that, that hope that we're supposed to put in God's promise, we've put somewhere else, and it's driving our life in this direction that's not okay. If that's you this morning, I, I, I urge you, I plead with you during our time of, of worship, set your hope right again. Fix your eyes back on the promise and watch as your life continues to go down the path that God has established it to go down. Keep your hope fixed in the correct place. I, there might be other people here who don't have hope at all. Maybe, maybe they don't have hope at all because they're not a Christian. If, if you find yourself, honestly, like that person that I described at the beginning of this sermon, just hopeless, and all you can ever do is maybe tomorrow will be better, and you keep doing that and doing that, and you're like, uh, this is it? This is all that, that there is to this? Friend, I have good news to tell you. It's not. The reality of it is, the truth of the matter is, that, that, that Jesus says neither has come. He has come and paid for our sins on the cross. And he died and he rose again and he ascended into heaven and he's seated at the right hand of the Father and he's ruling and reigning and one day he's going to come back to establish his kingdom on the earth. That's good news because everything's going to be okay. And, 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 and so if, if, you're, if, you, if you aren't a Christian and you, and you don't have Jesus as your king, if you don't have Jesus as the Lord, if you haven't joined Jesus' kingdom, then come, talk, talk to one of us. Talk to one of us during the song. Talk to one of us after, to, to me or Pastor Craig or, or, or whoever is a, you know is a Christian, and we'll talk to you about what it means to make Jesus king. And you'll experience the hope that we just can't stop talking about. So that's some of us, but, but the reality of it is all of us will face hard times. The truth of the matter is, is it's probably just a few days away that things are going to get hard again, right? And, and, and so wh- what do we do when things are getting hard? What do we run to? What, what, what are we leaning on as our hope? What is it in our lives that's doing it? Friends, the reality of it is it's all grass unless we stop and remind ourselves that this is what our hope truly is presence of our hope is rooted in the presence of our God. And if we don't remember that, life's going to pass us by and we're going to find ourselves in all sorts of messes. And friends, as a warning, you can't just think that one day you're going to remember it and things are going to be better. 
The truth of the matter is, is that we get so bogged down in all the things that are happening in our lives, all, all the problems and all these things, and we can't, we just can't see over it. But, but, but the, the truth of the matter is we have to stop. We've got to get above the storm. We've got to see clearly. Because that means we have to do things intentionally. Put a note somewhere in your house that says, if you're having a bad day, go read Isaiah 40. If you're having a bad day, stop. Take five minutes out of your day and read this passage again. And you'll find that that hope that, you've, that, that isn't there right now in those hard times will start to fade away as you fix your eyes on Jesus and his return. Friends, we have to remember that he has come, that he will come, and when he does, everything's going to be okay. That's our hope. Brothers and sisters, the presence of our hope is rooted in the presence of our God. Therefore, let us all eagerly await the day when we get to see him.